This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Mr. Roberto Vivo and his new book, War, A Crime Against Humanity. Mr. Vivo was born in Montevideo, Uruguay, and makes his home in Buenos Aires, Argentina, but is a frequent traveler to the United States and numerous countries in Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Over the course of his professional career, he has founded and directed enterprises in such fields as public works, commercial fishing, agribusiness, real estate development, telecommunications, and the internet. He also played an active role as a participating member of Uruguay's Colorado Party in that country's re-democratization process, both during and after the dictatorship that governed there from the early 1970s to the mid-1980s. In this book, he brings us a concise condensation of the history of war and the evolution of humanity's search for enduring and active world peace. Mr. Vivo posits that in a world where nine out of 10 victims of war are civilians, every war is a crime against humanity. He studies the causes of wars and provides innovative ideas for placing the world on the path to peace. Please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Roberto Vivo. Thank you, Victor. Nice to see so many friends sharing this moment. I want to give a special thanks to the family of Books and Books, Mitch Kaplan, and especially to Cristina Nosti and Stephanie Fernandez, that together with Victor Santiago have made this possible. I would like to start my conference by saying how pleased I am to be speaking here in the United States. I am, as Victor stated, a Uruguayan, but have been a great admirer of the US ever since I briefly lived here when my family moved uh, to help my father advance his uh, medical training for two years. I was a very small boy from three to five. I attended kindergarten here in the United States. And my birthday is the 4th of July. So I learned that I have a very nice birthday celebration <laughs> since then. An American friend of mine who is an undeniable liberal, when asked what his politics are, will tell people that he is a 1776 conservative because he still knows what is worth conserving at all costs. I myself feel that there are a lot of us 1776 conservatives around the world. People who believe deeply in the founding tenets of American style democracy, equality, justice, the rule of law, and above all, the sanctity of individual rights. Months ago, when my team and I were working on the final preparation for the book that I'm about to present, there was no way that we could have guessed how the world situation would deteriorate in a few months. To such an extent that we would find ourselves today facing the worst climate for world peace since the Cold War era. There are currently 29 active conflicts in which between 150,000 people die per year. These conflicts know no geographic boundaries and are taking place in Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, and South America. Today, the people displaced by violence number 60 million, up 9 million from last year. At least half of them are children. The Global Peace Index calculates the cost of war to the global economy at $9.8 trillion. That amount is sufficient to cover feeding the planet's 900 million starving people for the next two centuries. To say nothing of what such an enormous amount of money could do for areas of education, medicine, science, and environmental research that will continue to be underfunded as long as the world sees military expansion as its top priority. 
And that's where we stand today. And since, ironically enough, this new set of circumstances coincides with the 100th anniversary, with the 100th anniversary of World War I and the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, I feel that the thesis of my book could hardly be more current. When I wrote this book, I was seeking to answer a series of burning questions regarding the scourge of war and the struggle for peace. Here are just a few of those queries and my responses to them. But first, let me tell you why my book is called War, a Crime Against Humanity. This title was chosen on the advice of my friend Benjamin Ferencz the last living prosecutor of the Nuremberg trials. Let's allow this great man, who is today 95 years young, to tell us why he suggested this title. Please. I'm being interviewed in Delray Beach, Florida, by my friend Roberto Vivo. Of course, war is a crime, but it's more than just a crime. War is the supreme international crime, as determined by the Nuremberg trials, of which I was a participant uh, in 1946. And the reason I felt it needed improvement was because war is a crime against humanity. And the nations of the world were sidetracked by uh, not referring it simply to what it is. War is a crime against humanity. They said aggression is a crime, but we have to define aggression. That was a big excuse to do nothing. Uh, and they have managed to do nothing on that subject very successfully since 1946, when they first decided that war should be treated as the supreme crime, and those leaders who are responsible should be held to account in a court of law. If you were to have the opportunity to meet Ben, you would be delighted. He's an exceptional human being, and it is truly an honor to have won his support. I will now answer the following question. Does violence form part of man's nature? If we review the last 50 centuries of history, we'll see that the human race has only managed to live in peace for a cumulative total of 900 years. In the last 35 centuries, meanwhile, over 8,000 peace treaties have been signed, generally with only fleeting results. There have been, and still are, observers who have insisted that human beings carry war in their DNA, that man is a naturally violent being inclined to invent enemies and destroy them. Contemporary science, however, does not agree. The most recent studies show that war wasn't an institutionalized or habitual practice among the earliest human beings, mainly because they were nomads, hunters, and collectors with a much reduced sense of property. The fact that these early human beings were under no pressure to defend property, reduce conflicts within the community to a minimum. Famed paleontologist Richard Leakey writes that it was only with the advent of agriculture that now sedentary human beings began to feel the need to defend the land they cultivated. So, in all probability, war originated as a social and political response to economic issues. In short, what changed in the transition from a nomadic hunting and gathering lifestyle to a sedentary agricultural one was the nature of society, not the nature of man. Another clear piece of evidence that humans are not naturally violent is the fact that armies all over the world subject their soldiers to rigorous physical and psychological training designed to turn them into killing machines. An essential stage of this training 
is aimed at dehumanizing the enemy. In other words, the goal of this training is to ensure that the supposed enemy loses his or her identity as a person. Despite such training, however, since human beings are not normally wired to act, act like murderers, thousands of soldiers returning from war end up resorting to alcohol, drugs, and even suicide in the search for their lost peace of mind. Is the just war theory still valid today? It might be said that the just war theory was born in the fourth century by the hands of St. Augustine. His purpose was to limit the number of armed conflicts in a violent world. But it was also a means to justify violence as morally and religiously acceptable in a world where war was sometimes necessary. Today, however, there are new circumstances that fully justify reconsideration of this doctrine. Arms of extraordinary destructive power and armies that frequently mingle with innocent civilian populations are just two of these. Think about this. In wars fought up until the early part of the 20th century, nine out of every 10 victims were military personnel. Today, that ratio is exactly reversed. Or in other words, today, 9 out of 10 victims of war are civilians. In the First World War, civilians' deaths totaled about 11% of all war fatalities. In the Second World War, 50% of all Fatal casualties were civilians. In the Vietnam War, 86% of total deaths were civilians. But as of 1992, civilian fatalities in wars and other armed conflicts make up over 90% of the total. Clearly, there might possibly be times in which, as a last resource, the use of defensive armed force could be necessary, but this should only be undertaken through a multilateral agreement, for example, with the support of the United Nations. I'm going to ask all of you to take this single concept, if nothing else, away from this presentation, and that you keep it in your memory. The fact that nine out of every 10 casualties of war today are civilians is a sufficiently compelling reason to state without a shadow of a doubt that in today's world, all wars should be considered crimes against humanity. Let's go to the next question. If all the great religions have a message of peace, why have they so often been cause of war the Axial Age is a period that ran from about 800 to 200 before Christ. It was first named as such by philosopher Carl Jaspers. It was during that period that in four different regions of the world, four great traditions were born that continue to nurture humanity around the world today. Confucianism and Taoism in China. Hinduism and Buddhism in India, monotheism in Israel, from which both Christianity and Islam were derived, and philosophical rationalism in Greece. I have no way of demonstrating that great social and cultural changes are always based on religious beliefs. In fact, that's probably not the case at all, but rather in these major mutations, linguistic, political, economic, demographic, environmental, and other variables enter the mix along with the spiritual or religious variables. Be that as it may, I want to propose a reading of history with a religious bent, since I believe that the deepest of convictions, the ones that have to do with life and death, 
have certain unique traits. So, what is it that all the great religious traditions have in common? All of them have a core message of peace. And this message can be summed up in what has come to be known as the golden rule, the basic principle of which is don't do to others what they wouldn't want them to do to you. The golden rule is universal, and the desire to abide by it is also practically universal. That's why it's so hard to understand why it has been so difficult to put it into practice, and why indeed seems at times to be downright impossible. It is in reflecting on a passage in the Bible that is apparently simple and yet pregnant with deep meaning that I found a response to this question. In this biblical passage to which I'm referring, Moses comes upon the burning bush and asks the voice that speaks to him from within, what is your name? To which Jehovah answers, Eaye asher Eaye, or I am what I am. This mysterious phrase has been interpreted in many different ways, in many cases perhaps without bearing in mind the Jewish cosmovision of that era. But what God appears to be saying is, you'll never truly know who I am. You'll never control me. You'll never be able to encompass me within your poor intelligence. I'm different from anything you can possibly imagine. So don't try to reduce me to your limited mental framework. I am the father of everyone. And to each of my children, I have manifested myself in different ways. None of you knows the complete truth about me, but each of you has a clue as to who I am. This is then my conclusion. Celebrating diversity consists in going beyond mere tolerance. It involves discovering posi positive value in variety, in definitively preferring diversity to unanimity. It implies overcoming the psychological barrier that has for centuries immersed humanity in fear of the unknown. In this way, the different, the alien, which is initially perceived as a threat, as something that produces mistrust and even fear, can end up being something good, something desirable. In today's globalized world, with its ready access to the new mass communication media, this is clearly possible. That is why I propose celebrating diversity. Celebrating diversity is overcoming the weakness that has, until now, kept us from universally applying the golden rule. Now I will answer one final question. Is it utopian to think that there will come a day when war is universally considered a crime against humanity? War is no longer an effective way of solving any conflict whatsoever. In the past, an aggressor in a war had at least 50% chance of winning. By the middle of the 20th century, that probability ratio had dropped to 30%. In the 1980s, it slipped to 19%, and it is very likely even lower today. A good example is what happened in the Iraq war. Just six weeks after the conflict began, on May 1st, 2003, then US President George W. Bush stood on the deck of the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln and announced the end of combat operations. Behind him hung a banner that read, mission accomplished. More than a decade later, Iraq still has no stable democracy and the war continues to claim dozens of lives a day, most of them civilians. Furthermore, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant Amid a campaign of true terror is today occupying a large part of Iraq, while actively 
participating in the Syrian civil war. It is true that this new violent and ideo ideologically extremist threat that is spreading like cancer throughout significant areas of the Middle East calls for a defensive and democratic response. But it is also just as true that this terrorist movement was born of pernicious intervention in the region and that its growing popularity in certain segments of the population responds to the disappointment of these peoples who a decade ago dared believe in the dawning of democracy and liberalism and have known instead only death, destruction, spurious political deals and state of siege. Fundamentalist terrorism then rises to fill the gap that the West itself, led by the US, has created thus having lost all credibility in the region. The key in seeking to find an effective solution to the swift advance of this new fundamentalist threat then must come through international institutions and must be carried out in search of defensive action leading to a lasting and equitable peace in that area of the world. It is important to understand that the 20th century world order was based on nation states that monopolized power within their territories and on peace treaties among sovereign states. This formula was born in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. It's a system of justice in which there are no friends or enemies, but individuals with rights, even when they have committed crimes. The United Nations was born in 1945 as a permanent forum for negotiation, but the Security Council, or at least its five permanent members, the US, France, Britain, Russia, and China, can, according to law, help their friends and attack their enemies. Until now, this model has indeed prevented the outbreak of World War III, but it has not prevented wholesale slaughter in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Since World War II, the Nuremberg trials, and especially the end of the Cold War era, several organizations have worked hard to mitigate the effects of large scale violence on two fronts, prevention and conflict resolution. In fact, we might say that the concept of world justice was born with the Nuremberg trials, since that was where, for the first time, judges didn't represent a particular, a particular country, but humanity as a whole. Inspired precisely by the Nuremberg trials, the International Criminal Court was founded in 2002, with the aim of changing the mind of those who thought themselves to be beyond the reach of justice within the safe heaven of their own borders. The risk of their leaders being brought to trial is so real that major powers like Russia, China, US, as well as other countries like Cuba, Israel, India, and Iraq have refused to adhere to the statute creating that world legal institution. This, the International Criminal Court is unique. It differs from early projects of this kind by virtue of the fact that it isn't an initiative of the victors in any war or of the major world powers, but is the result of a broad-ranging agreement among the world community of nations. The Rome Statue, on the basis of which the court was founded, was originally signed by representative of 136 states and has since been ratified by 122 countries. To someone who admires the history of American liberty and justice to the point that I do, it, sa it seems sad and contradictory for the world's principal democracy not to accompany this process that has all of the noble hallmarks of an initiative inspired by the founding fathers of this great nation. 
From the time of its founding and until he completed his mandate in June 2012, Dr. Luis Moreno Campo was chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. On February 2010, during a conference that he gave before the Independent Council on Foreign Relations, he said, and I quote, how can the work of the court contribute to the prevention of mass crimes? Those crimes that we have repeatedly believed would never happen again are occurring over and over again right before our eyes. Genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. I have but one word, institutions. He added that in our own countries, Congress, the police, prosecutors, and the courts are the basic institutions that establish law and order. Internationally, the Rome Statute enacts the very same idea. Judicial institutions have been created to contribute to the prevention and administration of mass violence. And finally, I insist that a crucial step on the road to world peace consists of putting an end to the ambiguity and discretionary powers that many states and especially the most powerful ones invoke when involving themselves in war. And world justice should effectively be empowered to pursue and try those responsible. It might appear that up to now there has been little advancements to towards ending war. But there is good reason for hope, emerging from the historical analysis of what happened with slavery torture, and racism. These deeply rooted practices, which in the case of slavery was at the time considered of key importance to economic development, were at first increasingly condemned and eventually banished. Today, they are widely considered illegal throughout the world. In order to achieve the classification of war a crime against humanity, a deep-rooted cultural change must take place. And for this to happen, we must support the action of the International Criminal Court, as well as promoting education for peace, a task to which each and every one of us can contribute. On a final note, if we ever want ethics and justice to be universally accepted, as the guardians of peace, we must heed the words of Pope Francis when he spoke on the dramatic situation in Syria. War is always the failure of humanity. War breeds war. Violence breeds wa violence. No more war. No more war. Let peace break out. Thank you very much. For sure, we are going to share wine uh, with the friends that w would like to hang around. I will obviously will stay to sign some books. If from absolutely, and I'm most than willing to take uh, questions. <laughs> if anyone is ready to. So, what's the solution with the ISIS crisis? What do you do? I mean, is there a diplomatic solution with them? Do you think there's a possible no. diplomatic solution? I, 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 I don't, I, as, as I stated, there are cases that uh, a military intervention might be inevitable, but I, I can see uh, the nations of the world working together to sort this out. But the, the most powerful nations have all their different interests, and sometimes they are selling arms to the two sides that are in the same conflicts, because the business is more important than uh, making peace. But sometimes uh, we, we see what can be achieved when the, the, the most powerful nations of the world decide to work together. I am sure that this work could be absolutely different if only the five members of, of the United Nations that have veto power uh, would decide to work together. 
the world could be absolutely different. Do you see any reactions of the political leaders after uh, Pope Francis' sayings and, and, and efforts? Well, uh, I believe every one of you have uh, been able to, to see uh, how relevant his recent visit to the United States was, being the first pope to address the members of the Congress of this country. I saw uh, the leader of, of the majority in Congress crying, uh, hearing Pope Francis' uh, words, resigning to his position immediately after. This is very symbolic, and I, I believe that uh, uh, Pope's uh, actions and example is uh, really uh, making the peace movement uh, more achievable and making everyone to realize. And he stated one single concept in which I with, uh, with whom I, uh, I agree absolutely. There is one ma major driver for war, and it's not the political problems, it's money. Money, and he said money, and this is a fact. We have the five members of the, of the United Nations uh, Security Council, the five members that had veto powers, are the five more important sellers of arms in the world. So we need, and, and this is at that level that we need to change. Either they decide to give a step and make something different, or someday uh, the, the, this structure should be changed. As you know, there has been on the table for the last 15 years uh, the proposition to include uh, five additional countries into the Security Council to try to break this status quo that is not helping. But words like Pope Francis are very important. You have someone like President Putin, as you say, selling arms, uh, you know, involving and bombing right now while we're talking. It's not going to be easy unless the world powers get together and do something where they curtail what he's doing. If not, it could lead to war. Uh, absolutely, but we have an example. We were today uh, chatting with Mariano Varela and and Gloria, and he was recalling a film, a Rambo film, where the Russians are occupying uh, Afghanistan, and Rambo goes to help uh, the Afghan uh, uh, militia to confront the, the, the Russians. Now, after that, the Russians went away, the US came inside, occupied, and now the Russians are selling the money to the same militia they were fighting. So this is absurd, it's ridiculous. But it happens over and over again. Not only money, but I feel power oh. is just as important Ab as, as the money. Absolutely. At, at what point uh, defending yourself uh, justifies the war? The right to defend yourself? The, r the right to defend, uh, it's, it's, it's part of the, 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 the legal institutions of all of the world. If you are attacked, you are you have the right to defend yourself. But there are different levels. If I'm attacked and someone wants to steal my watch, I can try to fight and avoid the, the watch being taken out. Or uh, if he's stronger than me, he will take the watch. But I won't take a gun and shoot him down because he wants to steal my watch, because the response is an over, absolute overreaction. So it, there must be a balance between uh, how one decides to defend himself when the situation comes up. Something that I didn't hear you mentioning, I think it's an important factor to probably help with you know, achieving peace is education. Uh, a population that is less educated, less informed, is more vulnerable to radical religion or political positions, and a more educated population, in theory, should be able to you know stay away from those things. So, is, is it something that you elaborate in the book? I mean, I haven't read the book. Education is key for development in every part of the world. We are now uh, experiencing um, a phenomenon with the migration into Europe. 
That has happened before because we all recall that Rome fall in, in year 400 with the invasion of the barbarians. This is a new, uh, a new migratory invasion with no armies. Uh, probably there won't be a military response, but it's a fact that this is changing and it's happening. And why it is happening? Because people from less developed countries are starving and they are uh, every day supporting war where nine out of ten uh, casualties are civilians and and they are running away from that because if you were with your family in that country and it, and you don't have any other alternative you would try to run away if all of the money invested in developing arms and selling Mars would he invested in helping those countries to really develop to really grow in culture to really educate to really feed themselves as I, as I told you we could feed with with what is invested in violence per year, we could feed uh, 900 million starving people for the next uh, two centuries. So these are enormous. I'm not saying that we are going to go from one day to the other to zero uh, arms, but uh, I am absolutely convinced that there could be, if the most powerful nations decided, a reduction in steps of the amount of money that is invested in arms, if they work together and decided that they want to change the world order instead of playing uh, as they have played. Uh, we, I stated that we have not suffered the Third uh, World War, but that war has been played through proxies. These most important countries and most powerful countries are supporting armies on other parts of the world and they are fighting wars and they are making business. But instead of investing in, in, in that money and supporting the counterparts to make uh, war, they would invest that money in developing those countries, help them to get educated. I think we could have a very different world. Thank you, Roberto. Okay. Thank you very much. And let's share a wine. All right, folks, so then if there are no more questions, a reminder for our internet audience watching at home, there's still time for you to call the number on your screen, and you can get the book shipped to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. For those of you here in the house, we have the book as well as the Spanish version, La Guerra, Un Crimen Contra la Humanidad, for sale at the counter over there. And we're also having a wine reception in the back, so buy a book, have a glass of wine, get it signed, and Roberto will be signing at the table to the left of the screen. Thanks very much.